But before we get started into our actual program for, for the evening, I'd like to introduce our partnering and collaborative organization, which is SWE, the Society of Women Engineers. We have the president of the local Los Angeles chapter here. I'd like to introduce Katrina Barhouse, who will give you uh, some updates with regards to their organization and some upcoming activities. Hi, everyone. We're happy to partner with SAE on this event and be here with you tonight. Um, I am from, as, as Delbert said, the Society of Women Engineers Los Angeles section. And um, we span the whole Los Angeles area and support all women across all disciplines of engineering in the Los Angeles area. Um, a couple of exciting upcoming events that we have actually for this Friday, the 12th of November at lunch, we have a exciting new um, technical lunch and learn series called Sustainably SWE, all focused on sustainable technology and solutions that are being developed here in Los Angeles and the Southern California area. Um, this Friday, we are talking with the company Our Planet Earth about closed loop um, recycling and how, how they're working to reduce plastic waste and eliminate um, single use plastics um, from, from planet Earth. So I will put the link in the, in the chat or you can please check out our website. Um, we have our newsletter there where we, where we send out updates to all of our upcoming events. And we hope to see you with more events with SAE uh, this coming next year. Okay, thanks Katrina. And again, for those interested, uh, please check out the website, losangeles.swe.org. Okay, as we move into our program for this evening, I just wanted to give the membership some upcoming updates for our activities. So tonight's webinar will be from the Art Center College of Design. We have some faculty members as well as an alumnus. And the title of this evening's programming will be Balance of Art and Engineering. Next week, we have Automobility LA as well as Commotion LA. Both are sub-events for the Los Angeles Auto Show, which will be held at the Convention Center. The Automotive, Automobility LA is actually a press two-day two, two press event. So, um, that will be on the 17th and 18th. Um, and then we have one more event before the end of the year, which will be December 8th. And that will be an ADAS event being held by a tier one supplier called Light. And they will be discussing their Clarity platform, which is a computer vision platform uh, that's uh, able to demonstrate ranges in the 10 centimeters to a thousand meter range. Um, so check that out as well. For those looking to follow SAE SoCal, we have our website. We also have our social media links. So feel free to check us out on YouTube at our subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Uh, we, we'd like to get our membership up as well in that area. And then those looking to get involved, we have contacts as well. Myself, Delbert Boom, meetings.tours at saesocal.org. And also our membership chair, Dean Case, he can be contacted at membership at saesocal.org. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening. First off, we have Mr. Jay Saunders, who is currently the executive director of undergraduate transportation in the design department since 2013. Originally joined the Art Center back in 94. In 2006, Jay became the director of transportation for the design department, a role in which involves supervising faculty, mentoring students, and partnering with other departments as well. Jay helped to establish the Art Center Car Classic, a high profile concourse covered by major media. And he's also a part of the college's diversity, equity, and inclusion council. We also have Mr. Stuart Reed, who is the chair of the transportation design department. He's a graduate of the college and has a 35 year career in transportation design. As a principal of Stuart Reed Design, he consults with the OEMs in various automotive and consumer product industries. Recently, he provided coachwork design for a historically significant Bugatti for the Mullen Automotive Museum, as well as design support for major automotive OEMs. So without further ado, everyone, let's welcome in Jay and Stuart to the panel. Hello, gentlemen. Hey, thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. 
We're really glad to be here. Um, Stuart, maybe if you want to give a little bit of a background on the school, I do have some images that I put together that I can oh, share great. here from my screen. It'll give you kind of some images that you can sort of talk from. Great. Yeah, that here I'm going to share. I think everybody can probably Yeah, see this that. is great. Okay. Can you see the image okay? Audio? audio good, Delbert? Yes. We're good? Yeah, you okay. guys are okay. Great. Take great. it away. Thanks. Well, uh, this gentleman in the image with, uh, you know, the beautiful architecture of Art Center's Hillside Campus in Pasadena is Ed Adams and a very interesting person. He uh, founded Art Center in 1930. And uh, Ed came from uh, Chicago Institute of the Arts. Um, he was in the advertising business. And so, you know, he worked with all the professionals in art and design, you know, uh, graphic designers, photographers, you know, filmmakers, industrial designers. And working in Los Angeles, he very quickly saw the need for a great school of art and design in Los Angeles. And his idea at the outset was to uh, really use all these great professionals that he was working with, you know, in advertising and in Southern California. And if you think about it, you know, Southern California was just bursting with energy, you know, in 1930. I mean, aircraft manufacturing, car manufacturing, filmmaking, art, architecture, uh, all these things going on. And so it was really uh, a great place to found such a school. And his idea was to have the professionals that he worked with as adjunct faculty. And amazingly, Jay and I still enjoy that today. I mean, we never would have predicted probably that in our field of transportation design, there are nearly 30 advanced automotive design studios in Southern California. And, and so uh, Jay and I enjoy a faculty of, you know, 35 or so, and, and nearly all of them are professionals with, you know, the, the various uh, advanced automotive design studios with almost every world, you know, automaking group right here in Southern California. So it's a pretty powerful even, image for, for Jay and me. Go ahead, Jay. Well, I was gonna, and now even going beyond Southern California, because actually with Laura, who's here teaching, you know, uh, with us um, now that we have instructors like her teaching uh, who don't even live in the Pasadena area, as you'll learn from her, she's with actually Alfa Romeo in Italy um, and still able to teach for us. So it's actually exciting that it's expanded even beyond the Southern California uh, area. But Suri, yeah. maybe you can talk a little bit about how in the beginning, it was really industrial design, sort of in the beginning there, and um, then sort of how transportation design came out of that. Yeah, so true. I mean, uh, these images are interesting. I mean, the one on the left goes back to, you know, probably the late 50s, I, I would guess. Uh, and then the other two images were projects that in the late 60s, uh, I recall on campus, those two projects, uh, submersible vehicle in, in the, you know, a single um, occupant rotor craft. I mean, I knew the guys that were doing these projects. And, and at that time, there was no differentiation, as Jay said, between industrial design or product design and transportation. It was really all seen as, as one thing. And, and even, even when I graduated, I graduated with a degree in industrial design. It didn't really say transportation design, though that was my intended field. So we sort of count, the school was formed in 1930, but we sort of say 1948 roughly was when transportation design sort of broke out as its own major. And we started having a students focusing specifically just on transportation design. And I think we, maybe we didn't mention the beginning, Stuart is a graduate of Art Center. Um, I'm not, I graduated with a degree in aerospace engineering from USC. Um, and so Stuart has been with the college, not only as a student, but also as an instructor. And of course now as department chair. What's this interesting, is our, and, and, if you just go back to that, go back to that photo yeah, sure. just momentarily, if you would. That photo on the left, uh, the gentleman on the left with the tie is George Jurgensen, and he was actually the first chair of transportation design. And th there were tight relationships, you know, between Art Center and industry at that time. And of course, it was the big three in Detroit, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. George uh, actually was a GM design executive that then came to chair the department at Art Center. And he was followed by Keith Teeter, a brilliant designer uh, that came from Ford. And then after Keith, it was Ron Hill, again from General Motors as, as chair. 
And, and then the next year, like the fourth year was, was Ken Okuyama um, from Japan who came to Art Center from his role in Pin and Farina. And then I'm, I followed Ken. So, and I never was with, you know, GM Ford or, but I did work for Chrysler for many years in the advanced studio and then later for Toyota. So, so it's been progressively broadening, you know, beyond the Detroit big three since uh, Jurgensen. So. So if we can give you just kind of a quick sort of tour, um, this is our main hillside campus designed by Craig Elwood. And the school was founded in downtown Los Angeles. The name comes Art Center College of Design because that was the art center of Los Angeles at the time. And then we moved from that campus to Third Street. And then now we've been at this hillside campus uh, since the 70s and then have additionally built another campus in downtown Pasadena. But this is the one where the transportation design department is currently focused. Um, and just to see the kind of pro, uh, programs we have, we have undergraduate transportation design, product design, environmental interaction, entertainment design, film, fine art, advertising, photo illustration, graphic design. Then on the graduate side, we have a program in transportation design, industrial design, environmental design, actually graphic design, which is not shown on here, and then film and fine art. So what's wonderful is all these different departments get to interact with one another. And so there's a lot of uh, cross pollination that takes place. So if you want to talk maybe a little bit about this, this is sort of a, a second term classroom where it really shows the hands on approach we take. Yeah, these students, it's it's for many of them, it's their first time to really be crafting a three dimensional object. You know, they may have come up, you know, through their high school years, sketching and imagining things and dreaming of designing things. But here we actually take them through the process of uh, translate. In this case, the assignment is a simple little small footprint narrow lane vehicle. And in their first term, they, they do some of the basic concepting of it and then they roll into second term, which you see here and actually develop sections, a three view drawing of it, sketch it, work out the details and actually craft it in clay and take it through to a finished object, actually finished in our shops and paint it, you know, like you would do in an automotive design studio. So then just to kind of show you a couple other um, classroom layouts. Um, this is one of our, what we call VizCom or visual communication. So these are students who are in their third semester of study, third out of eight, um, where you can see them using markers, oil pastels, coming up with different concepts for vehicles, but they're really learning about um, what we call stance, kind of how a vehicle sits, looking about proportion, really just getting um, the used to coming up with a variety of different designs in this class. Then this is a class, this is sort of then the next term, this is usually in the fourth semester, kind of halfway through the program where they're really getting into then true automotive design. And Stuart, do you wanna say maybe something about the fourth term exteriors class and kind of what's going on here? Yeah, and this one, uh, you know, we have them do a more complex thing. They're actually beginning to use digital tools to, to define three-dimensional form. They've worked out a package layout. Uh, the brief is generally around a brand. And so each term, you know, the uh, faculty spring on the students, it's, it's going to be a brand like Tesla or perhaps, you know, uh, reimagining, uh, I think they did one, <laughs> reimagining one for the Porsche brand or whatever it is, but it, the, the brand awareness is really a part of it too. So they're articulating design language that's appropriate for it. And we have them craft a half model down the center line and put it against a mirror so they're not spending all of their time crafting symmetry into it. And uh, this again ends up with a beautifully finished presentation that's done like you would do in a professional studio where you finished a series of models around a common brief and then evaluate them. And we invite professionals to come in and you know, here you see some professionals in the studio uh, this is near the end. They're getting ready to paint them. So this is out of our 14 week term. What would you say, Jay? This is maybe week 12, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Something probably pretty like close. That. Yeah. 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 It's so amazing a, what happens during those last few weeks. of the Yeah. Term. So there's, a, there's a low level of panic developing right here. Yeah, that's right. You can see it in the eyes of a couple of students yeah. here. Yeah. Um, then sort of, then this is at the other end where this is really then in the final presentation, um, in an upper level classroom and, Stuart mentioned the original founder, Edward Tink Adams. He had a philosophy that it doesn't matter how good your idea is in your head if you can't present it in a way that someone can really understand it. 
And so we have a real emphasis on craft and on having um, the ability to not just have an idea, but to really be able to communicate that idea in two dimensions, as you see on the walls here, high level of expertise in drawing and rendering and sketching. But then the modeling in the foreground here, there's a yacht that one of the students designed in a marine design class. And so we not only look at automotive, but we look at marine power sports, motorcycles, uh, watercraft, aircraft, kind of all of that. Um, is important in the in the whole scheme of things. You might mention Jay, who's in that picture? There's a couple of interesting characters. Yeah, there. a couple. So in our alumni. So right behind the yacht, there you see Derek Jenkins, who's currently head of design for Lucid. Um, you may have heard of them. You know, electric uh, company up in the Bay Area. And then uh, just to the right of him, you'll see Freeman Thomas, who was at Porsche, VW Group, Chrysler. Uh, he retired as head of Ford Design. Um, and then actually sitting down in the, the blue shirt. Advanced design, yeah, thank you. And then I'm um, sitting in the blue shirt down there, Jason Hill, son of Ron Hill that Stuart mentioned, the chair of the department. Um, but he's also done a lot of design. He worked for Porsche. He worked also for a company, Aptera, that was doing some really interesting early stuff with um, electric um, and very you know, strong aerodynamics. So just a real uh, strong group of folks here in the room. And then wanted to show this in terms of where we're going, you know, with the future. Um, students doing more and more with um, digital, with virtual reality. The students are using a program called Gravity Sketch to actually construct um, vehicles in virtual reality and then to share and present those. Um, we'll have classes all coming together. They've got a uh, app called co-create that's part of gravity sketch where a whole classroom of students you know put on their goggles and they go in and they present together in a virtual uh, on a virtual platform and so that becoming a, a big part of what's happening in the studio and so of course it's what we're doing um, in the classroom and then that relates to this this was taken just a few weeks ago where because of the pandemic now we are doing a lot more um, with sort of in-person and remote. This is a sponsored project with NEO, um, a Chinese-based car company, where we had um, students in Pasadena physically, and then also students virtually all over the world, in China, in the East Coast of the US, in Korea, all working together in teams, presenting to sponsors who were in Shanghai and Germany, all happening simultaneously. And so it was quite a feat kind of getting it all to come together, but it, it worked really smoothly. And so that kind of for us has been helping us look at new ways of learning, new ways of teaching. And that's kind of then uh, a good segue, I think, to Rose um, Piccioni, who is here and who's heads up our Art Center online programs and has been helping us in our department to really do some exciting stuff. So Stuart, you want to maybe say a couple of last words and then maybe introduce Rose. Yeah, yeah. Who's going to talk you were just about touching on it. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. You yeah. were just touching on it. I mean, the amazing thing for us about having all these professionals from the various studios teaching is that just like you were just saying, they are all now working this way. They're working on programs in multiple time zones around the world, whether they're with you know, VW Group or Ford or, or BMW or Honda. All these uh, instructors are working on projects globally, multiple time zones. And so they're able to teach those same approaches with their students. And so it really is preparing our students for the, the way the professionals are working right now. So it's, it's a really exciting thing. So, so, so Jay, I'll, I'll let you sharing. introduce, I'll let you okay, introduce great. Rose. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so Rose Piccioni, our associate provost for online education. Uh, she also oversees all of our art center extension which basically it used to be called Art Center at Night, Art Center High. It's sort of the programs we have that help to prepare people for either um, applying to the degree program at the college or just to develop um, skills and things that don't necessarily lead to a degree. And so um, Rose has an incredible background and she's been doing an amazing job with her team creating a whole online um, portfolio for Art Center. Um, and then additionally, she and her team have been critical for us as we had to make the big pivot like everybody um, during the pandemic to go from our regular in-person classes to overnight basically teaching everything online. Um, and so I'll turn it over to you, Rose, and uh, you can tell them what's going on uh, in your world. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Jay. Uh, thanks everyone at SAE and all of the associate membership organizations. We're really happy to be here tonight. 
Um, so Art Center has been, as you just saw, a very traditional um, location-based institution, but as the world changes and our student demographic changes, Art Center has really embraced thinking about how we can participate with people across the world in teaching and learning. And we're very much known, as you just heard, for our transportation design programs, especially, especially from the point of view of the design being futuristic and really creative. So we have worked with the department, with Stuart and Jay and faculty, to create the first series of professional car design courses that you can take anywhere in the world and you don't have to be enrolled, you don't have to be matriculated at Art Center. So the professional car design course series that we're offering right now really gives learners of all backgrounds the opportunity to learn the basics of this profession. So the things that you just saw in those photos we're going to start with the very beginning part of that, but you're going to learn how to sketch. You're going to learn how to use the correct tools. Um, you can see our faculty member, Leon Paz, sitting there with Geoform models by him. That's something that you're going to learn in this course. And so you get to learn with Art Center faculty and alumni experts. So we have the opportunity where you can take the experience with a faculty member leading you, or you can take the experience completely asynchronously yourself. And this entire, the two courses out of the three courses, we're finalizing our third course now, but the first two courses are built and we'll be running them again in the spring. You really can develop your skills and design style. So this gives you the opportunity to take it either through a self-paced or a live interaction course. You can produce uh, weekly assignments with the tools of the profession. So if you can think back to the photo that was shown with all of the, the posted sketches on the walls, that's the same kind of content that learners with no background in sketching or art will be able to produce after they participate in this course. Um, we produce weekly assignments and they're put on our tool, uh, which we call CRIT. It's a critique board. And so the faculty members can review everybody's work. Students can talk with each other, share ideas, their chat feature. So you'll have your work critiqued weekly by your instructor and colleagues through that tool. Faculty members make recordings, they post uh, ways to improve your work online and uh, generally give you rich feedback on how to be thinking about the work that you're doing. And then you get to experience what we call a final crit. So this is what our final exams look like oftentimes at Art Center. And a crit is really that critique experience that is identified um, through the rigor and kind of the ethos of Art Center. So, we invite guests like Stuart and Jay and others from the department and other alums to be the guest experts and do that live review of the final coursework that each student turns in, in both our, our basics course and our intermediate course. So here's just a little taste of what the course environment looks like. We do have a series of templates that are produced to help with facilitating the learning, understanding the perspective, understanding the size, the shape, um, here's a sample on the right of some of the basic models, vehicles that we, we do the uh, production of five basic vehicles. So it's a city car, it's a GT, it's a sedan, an SUV, and a supercar. So everyone gets to try their skills with those five vehicles. And then finally, we welcome and encourage you to join us in the spring 22 term and the enrollment's now open. But we wanted to share with you, because you're here today, we're gonna give away five seats in the course, the, the basics course, uh, the foundational course. So the first five folks that email us to SAE, free seat at the email below, Art Center at online at artcenter.edu. We'll just look for them as they come into that mailbox and grant seats in that order. And if you're just interested in learning more, you can sign up and create an account at online.artcenter.edu to just try your hand at it and take the first lesson for free and begin, begin your sketching experience, see how it works for you. Um, so as you can see there, courses are coming up this January, starting January 31st. We encourage you to apply and we're looking forward to uh, tonight's presentation with Laura Arias. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Um, here, I'll do my little presentation here. And actually, let me just say a word 
floor before you get started. Um, we are so excited um, to have Laura here with us tonight. She was an awesome student and uh, has been awesome in her career. She left Art Center and went straight to what then was FCA, uh, working with the Jeep Studio. Um, now FCA has become Stellantis and uh, under Stellantis, she's now with Alfa Romeo. And uh, then in addition to all that, she's been teaching um, one of our courses and um, has done just really an outstanding job sharing her talent and uh, her skills and knowledge with our students. And so she's the whole picture. She's the student, she's the professional, she's the instructor. Uh, she's just all around awesomeness. And so um, Laura, just we're so glad and so appreciate you being here and representing Art Center and all you give to our students. So just want I'll to put in one, one, little, intro. One, yeah. one little plug, Jay. Uh, and I think I've told you this, Laura, I, you know, Ralph Gio, who is head of design for Stellantis, formerly FCA, a good friend, um, known him for many, many years. And, uh, you know, he went to a different school that's in Detroit, but he, <laughs> he told me recently, he always wished he could have gone to Art Center, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll, thanks, thanks, Jay, for those nice words. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here really quick. Cool. Um, so, I mean, Jay already kind of introduced me, but I'm Laura and I am an exterior designer for Alfa Romeo. Uh, I also teach at Art Center. So this is kind of how I started at Art Center. Well, finished. This is my graduating class. I had a few internships while I was there uh, at Bertone, Volvo and uh, FCA. That was who they were at the time. Um, as Jay said, I right after school, I hired on and uh, I actually started in the Dodge studio for like nine months. And then they moved me to Jeep. And then I was there for a few years and I've been with Alfa Romeo for about a year now. Um, and that's, that's me next to one of my cars that I, I got to work on. Um, and now I teach and this is uh, one of my classes were all remote. So um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I get to teach a design process class. So I teach them how to start with an idea and essentially how to make that a good idea and pitch it well and go along the process of, of design so that they end up with a somewhat legitimate looking car in the end. Um, so in the studio, we follow really the same process that we teach in the classroom. You start with your idea. So this is like the sketches that you pitch to your boss um, in a studio review. Usually you start with kind of rough sketches and then uh, render them out like this. So with the Renegade, we wanted something that looked more on road because uh, the current uh, Renegade at the time had um, a more of an off-road look and they wanted more differentiation. So we looked at ways to make it look kind of rally with these lights or bring the, the body color down. Um, and then they pick a theme and you render it up really nice so that your modeler can help you realize it in 3D. You go into clay, um, kind of in conjunction with digital modeling these days. Uh, they have the mill that's pictured there in the back. Um, and you'll be working on the digital model at the same time as they're working on the clay. So you can update it, they'll remill it. And then you have these wonderful modelers that come in and, and give it a, um, a beautiful human touch to the design. Um, and we keep developing it this way while we start with feasibility. Um, that's when we start to bring in, this is kind of a, what we look at with the engineers part of it. Um, but feasibility isn't just engineering we work with. Um, I say parts engineers, engineering where, you know, everything from, I've had meetings with uh, people that design the ring that goes around the sensor that goes in a front pocket of a car, um, screws, bolts, door panels, chassis, everything. We also work with aerodynamics, um, manufacturing, how the parts go together, um, how they fit together, how they're built. There's a lot of laws and regulation that go into um, the design process, the feasibility process as well. For example, if I look Back on this image, this was the sketch that started it, but there is a legal requirement for how inboard 
of the body your fog lights can be. So we wanted to get this look, but had to kind of keep pushing it out. And that was kind of a dance with uh, both regulation and engineering and design to try and achieve the look we wanted, that rally look, while um, meeting all the, the legal limits that we needed and being able to actually put the part together. Uh, for example, right here, there's a large stack up of clips and parts. You know, the fog light fits into a piece, fits into that cladding area. The cladding has to clip to the body color area. And then all of the parts here have to clip into this. So it just becomes a stack up of parts. So the de designer like me, you work with the engineers to help design those pieces so that we can achieve the goal and meet those legal re uh, regulations. And then the last part we work with is assembly. So um, we had um, something with the, uh, the Renegade when I worked on that, where we were having issues with um, the manufacturing line being able to physically assemble the part without scratching it. So we had to work with uh, the people that designed the process for assembling so that we could uh, come up with a way to make that part work uh, the right way. And so that was a minor phase with those teams. And then after that, it reaches production and you have a real car that drives out on the road. Um, and that's, that's basically the process over many years sometimes, but how it gets to how it gets to the road. Um, design and engineering together, um, you know, how does that come together? What what does that mean? So first off, you know, designers I think like to think that maybe we don't need engineering. Um, and this is a beautiful car. This is one of my favorite concepts. Uh, it is a Strata Zero. This is not a road feasible design. But you can tell. I mean, it's a beautiful design. And that's kind of sometimes what you get if you have design without any engineering. You have that. But on the other side, you know, you want um, a beautiful car, too. This is, you know, a little bit of a joke, but um, a car that is engineered but not designed. But what, uh, you know, what does design do? Like, why is design important? Um, why does it matter beyond just aesthetics? Um, it influences perception. And what does that mean? So I ask my students, what is the difference between Lamborghini, the, the buyer, who buys a Lamborghini versus who buys a Ferrari? Both are performance cars. Both are very expensive. Um, the students say the Lamborghini is for new money, for the show off. Ferrari is for old money, for the gentleman. So really what plays into those images of the buyer is design. You don't want a Lamborghini to look like a Ferrari. If somebody wants their design to be avant-garde, ostentatious, show off, you don't want something that's refined. You want it to be a little bit in your face, aggressive. So those aesthetic cues that we as designers learn to communicate help bring that brand a cohesive image in design. And same with Ferrari. So Ferrari, you know, you don't want a brash Ferrari. You want it to be tasteful. So those cues are, are softer and more uh, delicate and refined. So that's how we um, can influence a brand overall. Uh, the perception of a car is capable or efficient, if it is comfortable, those are all design cues. It goes into the kind of psychology of the buyer. The Mini Cooper, uh, their SUV is actually a great example of how we can manipulate perception with design. Um, this vehicle looks very, very small. It looks nimble. But once you put it up next to another vehicle, you see how large it is. It's a, it's a regular SUV. It is a large SUV. But it, we use design lines. We use 
uh, the skills of manipulating your eye to make it feel like a smaller, more nimble vehicle. But we can't either side work independently. Um, you know, great engineering or great design works in collaboration with engineering and vice versa. Great engineering works in collaboration with design. Um, this is a good example. I mean, the, the Aztec, I think, is one of those infamous designs. But part of the reason it was infamous was because of the platform it was on. Um, if we adjust some of the proportions, it looks a little bit more palatable. And that's kind of the influencing that when we work together, we can have on the success of a car. Um, we can also help consumers embrace new technology. So if, we, if Tesla had introduced this latest Tesla front right off, people would have likely had a jarring reaction to it. It's too different. So Tesla very intentionally had this path of something that felt normal, but really wasn't. It was still all closed off. And then they sort of slowly walk the consumer to a palatable change so that by the time they reach what essentially is the engineered version here, you know, they don't, it doesn't need the air in front so that we can get the, the customer to embrace something new. Um, and that's, and that's basically how we work together. Um, I can open it up to questions or. Laura, I know that there was a question in the Q&A. Um, one of the attendees is asking, hi, Laura, oh, what, what was your professional educational background, art engineering automotive before starting as a student at Art Center? Um, before starting it, so, I mean, I did take Art Center's Art Center at night. Um, they had these courses where you can sign up and, and kind of have a, a boot camp of car design. I didn't, um, I took one several years before I went to Art Center. So I, I had a little bit of a different path. Um, Art Center is, um, you know, any college I think these days is relatively expensive. Um, and I did not have the ability to go to Art Center right out of high school like I wanted to go. So I, um, like moved out of my own and I got a job and I worked like, you know, regular people jobs, the kind of jobs you get with a high school diploma uh, so that I can save for college. And I always just kind of drew on the side. Um, and I took one art center class, um, uh, their art center at night. And then I took the second one, but then there was like a good six years where I was just kind of practicing on my own and, um, and I, I definitely had a lot of room for improvement when I started Art Center. I didn't really have any previous training um, beyond the, the Art Center at night. My high school had like one art class that I took three times. My high school was a agriculture school. We had cows and sheep and horticulture on our campus. Um, so that was like, we just didn't really have a big art program. Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't really know much when I started Art Center. Laura, I see there's another one, uh, in the chat. Um, someone's asking, what are your thoughts on empathetic design for a target customer mindset or empathic? Sorry. What are your thoughts on empathic design for a target customer mindset? That's from Thomas. Hmm. Um, Thomas, can you, I don't know if you can type in there. Can you elaborate? Um, let's see. Empathetic design for a target customer. I mean, if you mean how we approach a particular target customer, um, that is a process we sort of learn in school. So, um, for example, let's say you're designing Jeeps, um, you know, Jeep is definitely an outdoorsy, capable, off-roading image. 
Um, not everybody that buys a Jeep actually does that, but that's sort of the persona that is what the users see themselves as. They see themselves as somebody that goes camping all the time, um, even if maybe they don't. So you want something that has that feel. So you might look for inspiration from other products that have an outdoorsy capable feel. We'll look at um, images that have a form language that describes something capable that may be camping tools or um, other mechanical bits and how, um, how that can influence a shape. I hope that makes sense. Um, who, I see another question. Um, who would you describe the target customer for two different design tastes? Um, Julia and the A4. Um, I mean, yeah, so, okay. So they're asking, you know, if someone is attracted to sensual design uh, versus geometric design, um, that's part of kind of what we study um, in the brand identity. Um, certain brands, like another good example is uh, Subaru and Volvo. Subaru and Volvo both have a safety kind of family persona, but Volvo has a very um, like restrained and refrained kind of um, upscale look. Whereas Subaru is a little bit more outdoorsy, granola and so on. Um, and so their mindsets are different. You look at what they value. So for example, a Volvo person may value minimalism. And um, you know, if we imagine what their home might look like, what kind of music they might listen to is this halo buyer that we envision. Um, a, a Volvo buyer um, might have like, you know, a, one of those modern steel houses with a, uh, a lot of like mid-century modern um, inspired furniture, um, very sparse stuff on the walls. So we think of other objects that might be in their house and how that can influence the design. Versus Subaru, you might imagine somebody, um, you know, that has a lot of plants in their home and um, uh, stuff like that, if that makes sense. And then you might look at like their camping gear and how, like, even if let's say both Jeep and Subaru were to go camping, you might look at their gear and think about um, them buying different objects and, and they have different personalities that go into that. Um, you know, just kind of the different ways of looking at it. One of the projects we do at Art Center right now, I have a class we are um, designing vehicles for a particular sport. So it's sort of a tool for students to understand how um, the personality of the buyer is projected into the things they do. So the students are picking um, an extreme sport. For example, if uh, you have somebody that does parkour and somebody that does surfing, different images immediately come to your mind of who that buyer is. You might have an image in your head of parkour being city and, um, you know, having like Adidas clothing and they're all about like sneakers and maybe techno music and they have a different aesthetic, a different persona. And then the surfer is on the other end where he might have uh, billabong clothes and, um, you know, like really relaxed hair. The other guy probably has like spiky hair. You kind of imagine who these people are and what they own and how you can create something that feels like it belongs in their life. Um, I see another question. You mentioned the collaboration between design and engineering. What about the collaboration with product planning? Um, where does that work and where does it not? Um, 
There is collaboration between design and product planning. It happens a bit above my pay level. That is more of a Ralph um, level of things. Uh, by the time it gets to the designers, we're sort of told what will design, just not how it will look. We don't get to choose, um, you know, how we don't get to decide the platform, for example. Um, and if there's like a design intent, like a direction of some, if the brand wants to go more futuristic or more retro or whatever, um, all of that is sort of determined by product planning, but um, it's really like them working with Ralph, I think. It's all, it's all above my pay grade. Um, by the time it gets to designers, we don't really uh, get to decide on the product itself. Um, can I discuss the cultural aspects of design? How has American Dodge influenced um, Italian Alfa Romeo? Um, I mean, the design studios are very separate. Um, we have our Dodge designers and we have our Alfa Romeo designers. So if there's that influence, it's happening at the much higher echelons. Um, but I, I don't like the design studios don't really, um, uh, work in that way. I mean, we don't, we don't like trade. We don't all work on the same projects. Alfa Romeo works on Alfa Romeo and Dodge works on Dodge. Um, have you met designers that have mechanical engineering backgrounds? And if so, how do you think their background helps with their designs? Yes, yeah, so it's really common. Um, a lot of students at Art Center um, have a different education background. I've had, um, I had friends in school that had like uh, biology and engineering and all, all sorts of random things, but there were quite a few people that went into engineering, graduated, and then realized that they had kind of originally wanted to do design. Um, and they, they definitely um, excelled and, and went through very well in the program. Um, I would say the benefit is a you sort of had a head start on um, understanding the basics of a car. A lot of students start Art Center and they don't they don't know why like packaging is a part of our education at Art Center. Understanding how people and engines fit in the car. So if you have an engineering background, you may already have a greater understanding of that. Um, but on the other side, I would say the struggle is you really have to make sure that. Um, you don't have too many rules in your head. Design is a little bit about pushing the limits. So you want to make sure that you're still open to pushing those limits and you don't have too many rules in your head. Um, uh, let's see, I see. How did I decide to pick automotive design over other design paths? Um, for me, it was always automotive design, 100%. Um, I... Again, growing up in a really small town, I um, I really only knew about like fine art and interior design when I was in high school, and neither of those had any appeal to me. Um, I took an auto shop class when I was in high school so that I can learn to work on cars, and I just fell in love with the mechanical side of cars. Um, they made a lot of sense to me, being able to take it apart, put it back together, um, and um, when I that sort of sparked, I'd always drawn, like my whole life I've always drawn. But once I got into cars, I started, you know, reading all these car magazines. And uh, I always found myself kind of flipping to the back of the magazine where they had the coverage of the car shows, like the super cool concept cars. Um, and then they had an interview one day of a car designer named Chris Bengal and I was like, wait a minute. So I can, I can draw cars all day and you'll pay me. So, um, you know, that was, that was it for me. I didn't, I didn't ever want to do any other aspect of design. It just didn't have any appeal to me. Um, I mean, when I was a, a kid, I really wanted to be a stunt car driver. Thank you. Growing up in California. Um, 
near near Hollywood. Um, and uh, and I and I wanted to be like I like drawing. And I really, when I was little, I really wanted to be an inventor. I didn't know that like inventor wasn't a job, but you know, there was a lot of movies in like the eighties where, you know, you had a, like honey, I shrunk the kids where the guy is like an inventor. And that was his job. You had doc Brown in um, back to the future. He was like an inventor. So I was, I was like, I can be an inventor. And I didn't really know what that was. And I think in a way, um, I got to do everything I want to do. I like art. I like um, understanding how things work. And design is sort of art with invention. And and that's kind of fun. That's what I like. Um, and that's kind of how I pick the major. Um, does designing for future powertrains mean a bigger need for working with engineers? Well, we always, honestly, we always need to work with engineers. There's never, I would say, a bigger need because we always, like, if you left it up to designers, the car would never make it down the road. Um, you know, we need engineers to make it all, all possible. Um, and um, as the powertrains change, I think... Um, you know, there's definitely going to be some new challenges on the road, but it's no different than the past. Every era of car design, the aesthetics have essentially followed the engineering challenges or societal challenges of the day. So you had, sure, you know, um, when we had, um, let's see, like I think in the 1960s, they had some advancements in steel which made it so that they could stamp steel differently and make panels lighter. So that's when you moved from like the big heavy cars of like the thirties and the forties and, and early fifties and the cars started to get lighter looking. Um, and then, um, you know, in like the seventies and, and early eighties um, cars got bigger again and boxier because suddenly we learned about crash safety and, we had to start packaging all of this extra engineering stuff in there because, you know, a car that crashes like a beer can isn't really the safest thing. Um, so, you know, that once they added all of that, we had to design around that. And that's where you got like the paper, the folded paper look in uh, car design. Um, and then uh, when crude oil became uh, a big issue globally and people wanted to be more efficient with their cars, uh, we had more aerodynamic cars. So in the 90s, they kind of had that jelly bean look because they needed to adjust for the aerodynamics demands of the days. And then uh, I think in the early 2000s, stamping technology advanced uh, where you could design, put more design into the car, which, um, and then right now we're experiencing a lot of advancements in like lighting so you can have a lot more interesting details and lighting in a car than you could uh, 15 years ago. Um, so every time there is an advancement in technology or even just a change in society, um, we have to work with engineering to kind of advance design along. So I don't think uh, the new powertrains or autonomy or anything like that really is going to be any different than anything in the past that the industry has dealt with. Um, can I talk about the role of the scene of the studio engineer and what qualities someone would need for that position? Um, I wouldn't venture to say what like the hiring things are since I I am not an engineer. Um, however, um, you know I've, we have so I can tell you how there may be different. Um, you know. We have our engineers that are in one side of the building um, where I want to say they're like the, the, the true engineers, you know, they, they design all of the parts in and out. And then we have the studio engineers that sort of have a foot in each door. They have an understanding of design and they understand our motivations. Um, and then they also have a deep understanding of the engineering side. So they're sort of the interpreter. They help two opposites talk to each other and achieve the goals. Um, so I would say a great studio engineer to me as a designer would be somebody that is willing to take the time 
to explain to me the root of the problem they're trying to solve so that we can work together to solve it. Um, somebody that is a great communicator and probably patient, definitely patient to work with designers. I, I hear. Um, Laura, I have a quick question. Sure. Sorry, Dean. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I think Laura, uh, Katrina has a couple of questions from the uh, Swede perspective. So, uh. Yes, I'm just wondering, Laura, um, you know, I find this really, really interesting. My, my day job is as a ride engineer with Walt Disney Imagineering. So we do all the ride vehicles and interface with, you know, creative teams and designers and worked in autonomous vehicle technology in the past. And um, I'm just in engineering, especially as usually one of the only women on my team, there's always been a perception with other in, in, in SWE also, we talk about this, that, you know, a lot of us don't work with a lot of other women. And <laughs> I, you know, there always seems to be a perception that there's probably a lot more women in the design fields than there is on the engineering and technical fields. And it seems like that might not be quite true either in your field. <laughs> do, you, um, do you have I any? mean, maybe at Disney, the animators and stuff, maybe there's more women. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's not a ton of women doing what I do. Um, I work with one, other, well, I, technically in my building now, I'm the only, I have another woman I work with that does exterior design. She is an exterior design manager, um, but there's no other like regular designers that are women like me for exterior design. There's um, plenty that are in like color and trim and um, interiors. Um, exteriors is sort of this weird animal, um, you know, where Do you have any there's, thoughts or there's advice less of how, us. I'm <laughs> sorry, on how we could, um, you know, help change that perception or, or change the message or, or, you know, we do a lot with STEM outreach, for instance, and the messaging is always geared towards engineering. Is there something we could um, do to help change that in your perspective or in your experience? So I think it's, I've had um, like an evolving response to that, I guess, as the, the years have gone by. Um, I think a lot of women, myself included, initially you have sort of a, a knee-jerk reaction to those, you know, women questions. You're like, you know, I'm not different just because I'm a woman, right? You're like, I, I design the same. But um, my understanding of it, of it has evolved in why, when people ask, you know, why do we need more women? And I think people have in their head that we you know, need women specifically. And I think it's the truth is that we just need more diversity. And the reason we need more diversity is because actually, since you worked for Disney or work for Disney, I think a great um, example comes from Disney. So uh, when they made Snow White, their first feature length animated film, they famously on the creative team only had white men. And their story was made about um, the idealized of the time woman that was like house cleaning and doing all the things that they envisioned would be ideal, right? Um, and saved by a prince and so on. And one of the animators, I, I don't remember who, but one of the animators was interviewed when they were, you know, getting some heat. At, Disney was getting heat for uh, having a formula for their movies with, you know, uh, um, being saved by a prince and, and very uh, monochromatic cast, if you will. But um, he said, you know, we had nothing but middle income, you know, upper middle income and, and same education. We were all white men, roughly the same age. A lot of us came from the same area. We had similar opinions. And he said it wasn't until they started to bring in people from different backgrounds to where they got more interesting stories like Moana. You know, they have people from Hawaii that knew lore and stories there. Or, you know, when you have a woman director for like Frozen, it's like she doesn't need a prince. Let's just have this cool sisterly bond with Frozen. So 
it isn't so much, my answer is like, it isn't so much about finding women about, it's more about just getting overall diversity, but women will inherently always be able to offer a different perspective because the world interacts with us differently. We are advertised to differently. We, you know, when we walk and we are spoken to, people speak to us differently. It's just a truth, you know. Um, We are given different toys to play with, um, different clothes. So the world to us is inherently different than that of a man. And whether it's engineering or design, you want different experiences that people can draw from to problem solve, to ideate, to come up with ideas. So you want a lot of different things. You want a lot of experiences. And the more experiences you get, the richer the outcome. And so I guess that's kind of why, that, that's how we can change the perception is to help people understand that it isn't like we need the estrogen. It's that, you know, we do have a different perspective. It isn't the DNA that gives us a different perspective. It isn't our chromosomes that give us a different perspective. It isn't like we're all going to design girly things, but we just have a different, a different take because the world interacts with us differently. Does that, does that make any sense? Absolutely. And I, I, I feel the same way. Love that, that um, you highlighted that it's about the diversity of thought and all of our experiences, no matter how we want to identify ourselves, where we come from, what our experiences are to bring to that design. Thank you. I would just offer um, being the other woman on the panel. Um, you know, I think that we also, there's a, there's a great book that was written years ago by a professor at Rutgers. Uh, it's called The First Sex. And it talks about women's responsibilities from the dawn of time, which was to me- men clothing, watch the fire, keep all of the people in concert with each other. It, it really focuses on how language is developed and as you're foraging and you're taking care of someone and you're watching the fire and you're doing all of these things because you're in this very social context is her, her hypothesis. I think that that also is important to be thinking about um, how that's changed over the eras. You know, how has that changed and what is it like today? What kinds of social experiences do we bring? What kinds of um, daily experiences? And this is both men and women, but I, I think that there's a thread there, especially for women to be thinking about what are we responsible for every day? What do we have to take responsibility for? Is it pets, parents, kids? Um, certain certain parts of our lives have they have expectations i remember seeing an art center student design a diaper changing table in the back of a vehicle when i first got to art center i also remember seeing a woman design a door for pets to be able to get in a little lower door so that you didn't have to lift the dog in every time the dog could actually get in itself so i mean i think there's some interesting things that Mm -hmm. i would say that just life experience maybe from a woman's point of view might be more um top of mind that would allow us to think a little bit differently. Um, I would offer up though to Katrina, I love that you, you worked at Disney. Um, I also did. So I think that there, there are lots of lessons there as well. I, I really love that we've had a chance to participate in making big, big experiences. I worked on the cruise line. I was one of the founding folks at Disney Cruise Line way back. Oh, and, exciting. Um, it was so much fun. It was so much work. But but that also on an engineering side, mine, mine was all in education, but just watching the engineering unfold in concert with design. So all the Imagineers that were working with all of the people like me who were the educators in the space saying, you know, the, the small children's space needs to look like this and it has to still be safe and it has to still have the right height sink and et cetera. So there's, there's this constant intersection of, art, design, engineering structure. I mean, there, if you get into these opportunities where, where you're working with creative people, all of it just blends together and you make fabulous things. So I just think that's one thing that's really encouraging with the groups of folks that are on this call today is that the magic is out there still. There are so many 
interesting things still yet to be made. No, yeah, I think, Rose, um, sorry, oh, sorry. Rose, an interesting thing, you know, you talk about all of the things that maybe don't occur to somebody else. Um, you know, uh, some companies have gone away from this, but the industry standard is still a male, 95th percentile male for crash test dummies, seatbelts and everything are designed around a 95th percentile male. And any woman that's gone in a car and worn a seatbelt, you know, it's not designed for us. Um, or, you know, um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what about, you um, you know, seatbelts for women that are pregnant and, and stuff like that, you know, um, how we can accommodate the people that actually ride in the car. Um, so there's, when, when you have everybody in the room, it, it really helps make sure that it's going to accommodate the people that are using it as a product. Um, there was a, uh, we were working on something in the studio and, uh, they, you know, had an, some of the guys in the studio had an idea on how something was going to work. And um, it was, you know, something that like rolls down and I'm like, I can't even see that. I'm, I'm, you know, significantly shorter than everybody else in the studio. And, you know, we, we stand in line and it looks like there's like a broken tooth. I'm so short, but um, you know, I, it just, when you're tall, you know, you don't really think about <laughs> the people that aren't and you're like, wait a minute. I don't think that's going to work. You know, I, I'm not going to like fling my groceries and hope they make it, you know, because I can't, I can't see it. I need to be able to see where I'm putting my eggs or like, you know, my arm is like not got the reach that somebody else's does. So all of that stuff is like important accommodations. And, uh, and that doesn't, that doesn't just even go for women. I mean, um, we have a lot of um, products in the world, not just automobiles that, you know, do it need to do a better job of accommodating um, different abilities out in the world. Um, for example, you know, um, airlines are really, really terrible about accommodating uh, people that are deaf. You know, all those announcements they make if the plane is making an emergency landing, if you're deaf, you have no idea. There's no digital announcement. They don't come by and tell you. You just have no idea because it's all audio. So there's a lot of things. The more people we include, the better we can design overall. We don't want to run this too late because I know that uh, Laura's on East Coast time. Do we have any final uh, questions or comments from any of the Art Center uh, guests? I just wanted to respond to part of this diversity conversation that I think it's also so important for us to have instructors like Laura because it's important for students to see themselves, I think, in the faculty and that for too long, we did just have mostly guys teaching. And that, you know, I know Laura even had, you know, a lot of experience with that herself as a student. And so we've been working really hard in trying to get more diversity on our faculty so that we're not just recruiting female students so they can be taught by men, because I think that's not the best way to go. And so um, so Laura and others, we've got Jenny Ha, who's up at Lucid, who's teaching for us. We've got Lily Malikian, who's at Honda. We've got um, Kimberly Marty, who's worked with uh, Tesla. And so it's been really great for us to be building our diversity within the faculty, because I think that not only helps with recruiting more diversity in students, but it's also just so great when we have a faculty meeting or when we have any input or we're on a search committee, um, that kind of stuff to get more diverse thought in terms of making those decisions. And so I think it's great having Laura here really representing that. And I hope that as Laura continues to be even more successful and you know more people know about the amazing stuff that she's doing, that it will inspire others because there are plenty of people who know about Chris Bangle or who know about you know these other well-known uh, automotive designers, but there's not a whole lot other than you know Michelle Christensen. Maybe a lot of people know about her because of the NSX, 
but we do need to have more women heroes in the automotive world and in every you know area. And so, um, Laura, no pressure, but I really need you to be <laughs> as successful as possible uh, so that you can you know help inspire you know more to to come our way because I think that is what we need. It needs to be moving in that direction, and uh, you're doing a great job with that. Oh. Thanks, Jay. And you know, Katrina, you talked about how do we make it normal? And it's kind of what Jay just said. And, and it isn't just about, you know, um, letting women that are majoring see themselves and their instructors, but it's also like just normalizing it by having women teach the next, like all of the students that have me and Jenny and Lily as instructors, when they get into the industry, if they have a woman that's their boss, they're not going to blink twice. Right. Well, I think, you know, it is a challenge, I think, for Art Center, you know, you look at it from the engineering perspective, we have several hundred great universities where you can get an engineering degree, but there's only a handful of places that teach transportation design. So, you know, it's, I was lucky enough to be a studio engineer early in my career. And so I've worked with some amazing Art Center graduates, and uh, but it really, it almost makes uh, a pretty, it's a tall task for you to have the diversity there because there isn't a hundred plus universities where you can that are graduating transportation designers. Well, that's probably good because I don't think there's that many jobs for us. No, if there's they, not. <laughs> if they have too many people major in it, it's going to be yeah. too hard to get into. <laughs> no, I agree, but it, it's just interesting that you know you look at it from the standpoint of you know it's a relatively small pool of instructors influencing a large number of companies, and then it's a lot of engineers coming from you know we do have. Uh, I think engineering still needs to do a lot of work in that area, but at least, you know, there are differences of universities and, you know, each university has its own flavor, how much of its theory versus hands-on. But uh, Yeah, I mean, it, it really is true that there's probably really only four or five schools in the world that make up the majority of the design yeah. studios. And uh, so it's, it's both, you know, a, a blessing and a curse, I would say, in that it, you know, helps us to be able to have, um, a lot of presence um, and that our alumni are able to do well in that industry. Um, but you're right that then, you know, there are sort of limited pools in terms of where you can draw from. And uh, so that's a, it's sort of, you know, it goes both ways, but we've been very fortunate, I'd say, because of um, our reputation and our legacy that we've been able to, to do very well um, in terms of most of the studios in the world um, being led by graduates from our school and uh, that's pretty exciting for us. And we hope to, to see that continue, but to have even more um, diversity of those faces um, in those positions would be great. I think that's where a lot of our organizations like SWE and SAE can come in and support, you know, our growth and development as professionals in our fields and create the community to help us learn from each other and, and, get the maybe diversity of thought and teams where we might not have it in certain workplaces or, or projects, but help each other grow and support each other. And hopefully we can help, help you guys all in that endeavor as well. Design is very much a, a STEM and technical field these days, it seems as much as engineering is. So <laughs> happy to support however we can. Yeah, we're really excited about not only tonight, but we do hope for some future opportunities to partner absolutely with both of your organizations. Yeah, I think as we wrap up, I mean, I, this is um, I think the third or fourth time the SA SoCal has teamed up with SWE LA. And hopefully once we get back to being able to do in person, I think getting, and I've been to your campus uh, a number of times, you know, getting an in-person uh, visit would be fabulous. Cause I think it, you know, the online courses are, brilliant from the standpoint it allows you to reach people who are not within a driving distance of Pasadena but I think for those of us who are in Southern California it's pretty amazing to see uh, the student uh, projects you know in real life in 3D so unless any other comments I'd like to thank Laura for staying up late uh, and joining us uh, Katrina for uh, involving SWE LA and like I said hopefully we are trying to do much more collaborative last year uh, we met Katrina she was on a panel we did on career opportunities we did that in conjunction with SWE SHIP and NSBE because uh, we are trying to you know make all of our events more inclusive whenever possible 
happy to be involved. Thanks for reaching out, Dean. And thank you, everybody. And love to um, stay involved and do so something it, again in the future. Yeah, virtual round of applause for uh, Laura and everyone at Art Center. So thank you very much for- uh, Thank you for inviting me. And uh, send a note to uh, Rose. What is the email again, if they want to be one of the uh, lucky people to uh, get a free course? It's online at artcenter.edu. And okay. we're going to give away five. And we're also going to have a future relationship where we're going to offer a discount for the groups that are on tonight. So um, if you don't make it in as one of the five, still reach out to us through email. And we just really want to be able to open up thinking about art and design with many great minds. And we look forward to working with you. Thanks. All right. It's been a well, pleasure, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.